If you're a morphine or a heroin addict, pardon me, you inject heroin into a vein, it reaches the addiction centers in your brainstem in about 14 to 20 seconds. We know that one of the elements that contributes to the addictive nature of a drug is the rapidity with which that drug is delivered. <clears throat> if you inhale cigarette smoke, you are basically delivering nicotine into the arterial system via the pulmonary circulation, but dramatically lags the left ventricle and lymph. You get a huge stratospheric burst of nicotine in the arterial circulation, such that nicotine arrives in the addiction centers in the brain in four to five seconds. So this is a very potent way of delivering rapidly a drug with high addictive potential. When nicotine arrives in those areas of the brain, it binds to a number of neural, neuronal receptors, nicotinic acetylcholine receptors, and there are about seven of these kinds of receptors. But the fundamental to initiating and maintaining smoking behavior is the alpha-4, beta-2, nicotinic acetylcholine receptor. And I can see, just by the way your eyes are opening wide when you're sitting up more excitedly, that you're all absolutely fascinated by the alpha-4, beta-2, nicotinic acetylcholine receptor. And I, so I promise to tell you a whole lot more in the course of the next few minutes. Okay. When those receptors are stimulated, they initiate neuronal discharge in that brain stem area, which triggers a cascade of neuro neurological stimulation or neuronal stimulation, ultimately resulting in the release of large amounts of dopamine in the foreground. And whether you like running 10K races, drinking fine red wine, dark chocolate, sexual activity, or jazz, anything which pleasure is involved, dopamine is involved. Um, and it's important, therefore, to understand that the brains of smokers not only function differently than do the brains of non-smokers, but they're structurally very different. Because when you become a smoker, and when you become an addicted smoker, and how long do you think it takes for somebody once they've started smoking to become addicted to the team? I want to give you the honest person in this entire front because Valerie is going to make something up. <laughs> How long do you think, Valerie? I'm not sure. Maybe a couple cigarettes? A couple of cigarettes? How, how quick did you think? I'd say five days. Five days? Mm -hmm. I've heard, Immediately? Yeah, I've, I've heard 12 to 14 cigarettes over a three, four day period. Yeah. Yeah. So you're obviously a much more informed um, group than we typically get here. So congratulations. Because, you know, Generally, people say, oh, three or four months, five or six months, and, and they're absolutely right. It, it, it's within three or four, once you've learned to inhale cigarette smoke, three or four days of inhaling over three or four consecutive days is all that's necessary to cement nicotine addiction. Um, and that cementing, if I can use that term, um, involves what we call an upregulation of these receptors. So the brain actually starts to produce more and more and more of these receptors. Um, and that changes the hard wiring, if you will, of the brain. And from that point on, in order to be able to function normally throughout the course of their day, smokers require a constant re-administration of nicotine in order to maintain what, what I've termed sort of neurophysiological equanimity. A degree of comfort, uh, you know, the ability to kind of function normally and feel fine, etc., etc. Um, and, and, and so it's in order to maintain that altered neuronal or neurological structure and function that people continue to smoke. Um, but it's important that we understand that this isn't just a bad habit. This just isn't a, you know, a, a lifestyle choice that, that people make that ultimately comes back to bite them, so to speak. What, uh, what do you say to someone who says, well, I don't smoke cigarettes, so there's no nicotine, but I smoke Yeah, so can we come back to that question? Sure. Okay. Because, so let's for, put that in our park list over here, the THC, marijuana, et cetera, and smoking cessation. Because there's some very real challenges implicit in that. Please. Can I just ask, <coughs> why do some people seem to become so addicted so quickly? And we know of other people who become so addicted so quickly, and we know of other people who can smoke on the weekends and don't care whether they have it or not, and this goes on for years? Right. Did you all hear the question? No. No. So why is it some people smoke, become addicted, and others we know of who only smoke on weekends or at the cottage and never ever seem to, uh, to, to, to smoke? 
uh, in, in a more traditional way. Uh, those individuals are termed in the addiction literature as shippers. And we could talk about where that term came from, but that's another story. They're called shippers. And, and these are individuals who, who are exactly as you described. It's interesting if you ask them, all right, go over the next few weekends without smoking at the cottage, etc., and see how you fare. And many of them are able to do that. And I've heard very elegant and erudite explanations from neurophysiologists and addiction scientists as to how this represents a different variation of an addictive behavior. Now, clearly social cues and stimuli probably figure prominently in, in those situations. And also, <coughs> this is a bit of a digression, but it's not my fault I'm responding to the question. Um, <laughs> it, it's also the case that whether or not you are likely to become a smoker, and the ease with which you are likely to be able to stop smoking, is very much a function of the degree to which the, the rate at which you metabolize nicotine. So imagine nicotine comes along and it sticks on one of these receptors. But your body is particularly good at rapidly metabolizing that nicotine and clearing it. And so what your brain says, oh my god, there's no more nicotine, I need more. So you're going to smoke more and more and more. So rapid metabolizers of nicotine tend to become smokers more easily, that's the good term, and have more difficulty stopping smoking. Slow metabolizers of nicotine are generally unlikely to become smokers. And if they do become smokers for a variety of reasons, they're generally going to find it easier to stop smoking. Um, and I would suspect there are some of us in this room who tried in high school or university or nursing school or, or, or whatever to smoke for a variety of reasons. Everybody was doing it. Cool guys were going for both being smokers. But somehow we just never could ever get into being a smoker. And I'll guarantee you that you're probably a slow and continuous <coughs> um, So that's a function which plays a role in that particular group of, of, of smokers as well. Um, just to continue the digression, when you place a woman on a birth control pill, you double the rate of her nicotine metabolism. When a woman becomes pregnant, her rate of nicotine metabolism quintuples. So arguably, it is more difficult for women who become pregnant or who are on the pill to stop smoking than, now, and it, you know, you shouldn't conflate this into, well, it's impossible for pregnant women to stop smoking. But, but these, are, these are factors that underlie smoking behavior that are generally totally unappreciated by physicians or clinicians or others. I mean, why should they know this? This is just a habit. If people are just better organized, they should be able to stop. I mean, every physician, every family physician in Canada knows that grapefruit juice interacts with statins, which we use to control lipids. But most of them don't have a clue about some of the things we're going to talk about in the next few moments that I just touched on in terms of the pregnancy, oral contraceptive <coughs> relationship with nicotine. Please. So why, why is it that physicians uh, have not been trained in the very basic information? I think you probably want to be asking your question to the dean. And he's not here this morning. No. Um, uh, absolutely, absolutely. Why is it that nursing schools don't? Why is it that we have such an inordinately high rate of smoking amongst nurses and professionals over in BC? I mean, there's a lot of there are a lot of people who have to answer a lot of questions in this regard. And your point is very well made and very well taken. Um, and so we are in the University of Ottawa Medical School, making sure that these issues are addressed in the undergraduate medical school. But unfortunately, what happens is that by the time we leave medical school, we've learned 80 gazillion million different things about 47,000 other things. And, and so, but your point's very well taken. Thank you. 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 Thank you